Over 12 million men, women, and children passed this way. Passed through rooms and corridors haunted with a special stillness which remains only in places once noisy with human life. Here they bought tickets for a thousand places in America. Here they traded their drachmas, their liras, and their ruples for dollars. Here they sang their first American songs, experienced their first American Christmas and Hanukkah. Here they waited to be given permission to pass over to the new land. Liberty's gallant, ageless lady have come immigrants of all nations. They have found the meaning of the famous sonnet by Emma Lazarus. Mother of exiles, from her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Keep ancient lands your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shores. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. That was Goodbye Forever there, the last little clip of film that you saw. A silent cartoon made during the Red Scare after World War I, and it's celebrating the deportation of agitators and Reds to the Soviet Union in what they're calling a Soviet arc. Before that, we saw a short little film about the Statue of Liberty. It's a portion of a three-minute film that's a newsreel from Pathé before our theme song, our Vintage Movie Night theme song, we opened up with a portion of Island of Hope, Island of Tears, which is a National Park Service film by Charles Guggenheim that is uh, still shown at the Ellis Island Visitors Center. But you can watch it all online if you want. The link's down below. Welcome to Vintage Movie Night, films about immigrants and refugees. I'm your host, Richard Hall. I um, love archival films. I love watching and searching for archival films. And best of all, I love sharing them with other people. So thank you for watching. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to Tacoma Park for hosting these programs. I've been doing them, I think the first one I did was back in 2013. So I've been doing these for a long time. And I'm always sort of trying to uh, toy with the format and try different things. Tonight I'll be showing a selection of short clips from longer films all having something to do with immigrants and refugees. Since we saw two short films just now about the Statue of Liberty, let's just go right away into another one called Body of Iron, Soul of Fire from 1986. Give me a tired, give me a homeless, give me a wanderer, give me a hungry, give me a tired, give me a homeless, give me a
Since 1886, the Statue of Liberty has stood here in New York Harbor. She came as a gift from the people of France to the people of America. But some thought she was a suspicious gift. Some called her a pagan goddess, while others saw her as the perfect symbol of liberty. But what about today? What does the statue symbolize now? And what about tomorrow? That's sort of a rock and roll take on the Statue of Liberty from 1986. That was put out by the U.S. Information Agency. Then I think it was called the U.S. Communication Agency or something like that. And it was um, uh, sponsored by American Express. That's a 26-minute film that you can find at the National Archives or you can find at the Internet Archive. Uh, that's archive.org. Uh, I'm not an immigrant or refugee historian or scholar. I'm just an archival film enthusiast. But I, I like building little collections on themes, so that's our theme for tonight. It's not comprehensive. It's just a selection of things that I, f I find interesting that I hope you will find interesting. We have about an hour of short clips to show, and I'll try to give a little introduction to each one. The first uh, longer clip that we're going to see is from 1917. It's Charlie Chaplin's The Immigrant. Thank you. 
<clears throat> apologies there if you're a purist. I know Charlie Chaplin composed his own music, but I couldn't find any copyright free uh, music, so I composed this little sort of reggae sounding <laughs> thing using GarageBand. Um, that picture at the end, you see Charlie Chaplin there is um, kicking an immigrant official in the behind. Apparently, uh, several sources have claimed that this is the, the, the film that brought Chaplin to the attention of the FBI, of the, um, well, the FBI didn't exist then, but of the authorities. And he did have a big FBI file, and he was eventually deported in 1952. Uh, this film was made only a few years after he arrived in America, but um, apparently authorities did not like the way he was treating authorities uh, in this film. So the next film that I've selected is a short clip from a longer film from 1920. These types of films are at a time in the 1920s when the, the, the thrust was to Americanize immigrants. They wanted them to become American, whatever that meant, as quickly as possible. So there you can see the National Film Preservation Foundation from the Library of Congress. They're the ones who have restored this 1920 film, and we're lucky to have it. The Making of an American. And this was made by the Connecticut. Well, let me I'll let you read that. So here's Pete, who um, has landed in America from Italy. This was made by uh, the state of Connecticut. And um, the, there's, there he's found his boyhood friend who's already on his way to becoming an American. You can tell by the dress contrast. Now Pete's looking for a job. Uh, the problem is he can't speak English. The, uh, the National Film Preservation Foundation says that at least 100,000 people saw this film when it was made. So Pete cannot find a job that matches his skills, so he has to dig ditches. Can't quite figure out the meaning of that cutaway. The African American laughing at him. So a laborer must know the language of the country where he lives, as Pete discovered to his cost. Can't read. Again, apologies for the soundtrack, the music, I, I composed it so it wouldn't be totally silent. He's a sadder and wiser man. You can see that little symbol in the titles, it says the state of Connecticut. <clears throat> So this film was made just at the tail end of when uh, immigration was at its peak in the United States. Pete was not happy until he began to study English. <clears throat> And 
Shortly after this film was made, there would be several immigration laws passed that greatly restricted Sure, right now, in across America, there are immigrants sitting in English classes doing the same thing. So, because he learned English, now he's got a leadership position. He's changed his clothes. He's a, he's got American clothes with a tie, and he's a supervisor. Next, we have a short clip from a uh, film that was first made during World War II in 1943. The version I have here was updated and re-released in 1947. It's a 24-minute film. It was made by the U.S. Army. Uh, it's a propaganda film that uses the Nazis to warn against intolerance. And uh, around the time of the terrible incidents in Charlottesville in 2017, this film went viral and had millions of views. So I'll just show a, uh, a four minute clip of it and then talk about it a little bit. There are all kinds of games and all kinds of suckers. Take Mike here, for instance. He's got everything, you might say. He's young, he's healthy, he's got a job. And he's got a country called America. It's a wonderful thing to have, America. Lots of room, room enough to raise plenty of food, big factories to make things a man can use, big cities to do the business of a big country, and people, lots of people, enough to work the farm and build the factories, dig the mines, and run the business. All kinds of people, people from different countries with different religions, different colored skins, free people. They can live together and work together and build America together because they're free. Free to vote, to say what they please, go to their own churches, to pick their own jobs. Yeah, Mike's got something, all right. He's got America. But there are guys who stay up nights figuring out how to take that away from him. I want to give you the truth, folks. The truth about America. I know you've got a lot of questions. You want to know why you're not getting the breaks you deserve? Well, I'm not a politician, but I've made it my business to study these things, and I happen to know the facts. Now, friends, I'm just an average American. But I'm an American-American. And some of the things I see in this country of ours make my blood boil. I see people with foreign accents making all the money. I see Negroes holding jobs that belong to me and you. Now I ask you, if we allow this thing to go on, what's going to become of us real Americans? I've heard this kind of talk before, but I never expected to hear it in America. This fellow seems to know what he's talking about. Yes, he knows our rights. What's the answer? What are we real Americans going to do about it? You'll find it right here in this little pamphlet. The truth about Negroes and foreigners. The truth about the Catholic Church. Now, friends, these books are free. Paid for by real Americans who want others to know the truth. Excuse me, young man, but are you actually going to read that stuff? Sure, why not? You heard what he said. Didn't you? Yes, I heard. Do you believe in that kind of talk? I don't know, makes pretty good sense to me. I'm speaking to you as an American-American. And I tell you, friends, we'll never be able to call this country our own until it's a country without. Without what? Yeah, without what? Without Negroes. Without alien foreigners. Without Catholics. Without Freemasons. You know these What's wrong with the Masons? I'm a Mason. Hey, that fellow's talking about me. And that makes a difference, doesn't it? These are your enemies. 
These are the people who are trying to take over our country. Now you know them. You know what they stand for. And it's up to you and me to fight them. Fight them and destroy them before they destroy us. Thank you. Before he said Mason, you were ready to agree with him. Well, yes, but he was talking about... What about those other people? But in this country, we have no other people. We are American people, all of us. What about you? You aren't American, are you? I was born in Hungary, but now I am an American citizen. And I have seen what this kind of talk can do. I saw it in Berlin. What were you doing there? I was a professor at the university. I heard the same words we have heard today. But I was a fool then. I thought Nazis were crazy people, stupid fanatics. But unfortunately, it was not so. You see, they knew that they were not strong enough to conquer a unified country. So they split Germany into small groups. They used prejudice as a practical weapon to cripple the nation. Of course, that was not easy to do. They had to work hard to do it. You see, we human beings are not born with prejudices. Always they are made for us, made by someone who wants something. Remember that when you hear this kind of talk. Apparently in 1951, a couple of academics did a study of this film to see if it had the effect, its intended effect. And they had groups of students to watch the film and they did a survey of them before and after. And unfortunately, they discovered that the film almost had the opposite effect of its intention. A majority of the students came out of the film thinking that what happened in Germany under the Nazis could never happen in America, which is the opposite of the intention of the propaganda film. Uh, I leave it to you to decide why that is. And you can read, I'll put the link for this article about the study. It was in Vox in um, August of 2017. So next I'd like to jump to a couple of classic classroom type films from one from 1946, one from the first one from 1953. And these are the, the short films that would have been watched by students during that period. And they were intended to teach them about immigration. The first one is Who Are the People of America, 1953. I'm just showing two minutes of 10. It's a coronet, in, coronet instructional film from Pralinger Archives, which is a great resource. And he's uh, someone who has collected thousands of what he calls ephemeral films over the years. And at one point, I think 2002, he donated 60,000 of them to the Library of Congress. And ephemeral film is, is like these classroom films. They weren't necessarily intended to be around forever. They had a purpose. Once they were, once that purpose was uh, fulfilled, the film was sort of forgotten. And that's how he was able to scoop up so many of them. In the cities, in the towns and country, we work together. We are many races and religions and nationalities. We are the men and women of America. We are also the children of America. Children of the city and of the country. Light hair, light eyes. Dark hair, dark eyes. The children of America. The children of America. The infant the youth, the old and the young, that's us. Her ancestors came over on the Mayflower, while he came himself from Italy. Both are people of America. American farmer, American farmer, the people of America. Housewife, businessman, weaver, blacksmith, Americans. A German doctor, a Swedish mailman, a Polish fireman, an Irish cop, Americans. We are the people of America, a mixture of the people of the world. 
America was discovered by the people of the world. Explorers of many nations charted the land and opened it to their people. Columbus of Italy. So I'm bringing the audio down and I'm going to end this clip soon because I just wanted to um, let you know that they always get to this point where they start talking about the discovery of America and in almost every case uh, the indigenous people don't exist. They're, they're, they're just erased from history and in this case the discovery is mentioned but there's nothing ever said about the people who were here before the discovery. So I find it nauseating to keep watching this but it's illustrative of what kind of education people were getting at that time. And um, not to mention, the next film we'll see is a, is a similar film. It's from 1946. It's called Immigration. And this is just uh, four minutes of ten from Encyclopedia Britannica Films. Also from Pralinger Archives, and you can watch the whole thing if you want to. We in America are immigrants, or the children of immigrants. We are one people, but a people welded from many nations and races. People who came to America during a vast migration from Europe to other parts of the world. In this migration, millions of Europeans left their homelands to settle in new countries across the seas. Almost two thirds of them came to the United States. When we became a nation, our population numbered just under four million. Each symbol here represents half a million people. Most of our people were of British origin. But there were also Dutch and many Germans, as well as French, Spanish, a great many Negroes, and others. So I, I kind of froze the film there where I just wanted to point out to you what's obvious is they say, when they're talking about who was here, first they use the little symbols of the white people. Um, they say a great many Negroes and others. That's it. <laughs> That's, they, they, heaven forbid they would say the word slavery, never said. Um, and the others, who are the others? We don't, it doesn't really matter. What matters are the people who came from Europe. At least that's the message I think they're sending with this film. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's obvious that people who say, let's make America great again, this is what they want to get back to. So we jump forward now to uh, an important part of this film where they talk about when immigration began became uh, restricted. In 1924, a law was passed to restrict immigration from countries outside the Western Hemisphere. By this law, the number to be admitted henceforth was to be in proportion to the national origins of our country's population. Uh, just to interject, what they're not telling you there is that that calculation of the percentage of the U.S. population was based on 1890, not 1920. So they went back prior to the big wave of immigration from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe because the people who were behind this bill uh, didn't want people from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe. They thought Northern Europeans were true Americans. This gave to Northern and Western Europe more than 80% of the total, while Southern and Eastern Europe received less than 20%. After 1924, immigration from Europe dwindled and virtually stopped during the depression of the 1930s. But immigration from our American neighbors went on. A century of immigration has brought in many people from Canada, and more recently, there has been a lively migration from Mexico, as well as from the Caribbean area. Today, these people of every nation and race 
have become Americans all, a people still diverse, but sharing common aspirations and drawn together in their common contribution of the skills and talents that have made America a great nation. The school has been a most important influence in the making of Americans. Here, the meaning of our country, its institutions and its culture reaches the children of every community and race and origin. Here too, the latest arrivals from abroad, young and old alike, have an opportunity to study the language and history of America. These people are preparing for an important step, admission to citizenship. Here, they come to testify to their fitness to become once and for all a part of the United States of America. Longs the promise of long ago. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. The other thing they don't tell you about 1924 is that the new law allegedly was trying to replicate the population of the United States. A per, you got a percentage of, from each country that was represented in 1890, but they, they excluded completely African Americans as part of the population because they claimed they couldn't tell where the slaves came from, so they couldn't let people in from Africa. At least that was their reasoning. The, um, <clears throat> so to prepare for this program, um, I've been reading this book from the library, America for the Americans by Erica Lee, uh, a, a history of xenophobia in the United States. And in her book, she points out that this 1924 restrictive immigration law was really the brainchild of someone named Madison Grant, who wrote a book called The Passing of the Great Race, which basically is a uh, pseudo-scientific white supremacist book talking about how if we don't do something, the true Americans are going to get overwhelmed by all the hordes who are coming in. And um, it sounds a little familiar to what some people talk about today, but you should know that uh, a fan of Madison Grant wrote him a little note and said that um, the book was his Bible and was very um, inspired by it, and that was Adolf Hitler, who was inspired by these restrictive ideas about purity, and you know the rest of the story there. So the next choice is for Around the World in New York, and I selected this one because it's a um, sort of a, it's an independent film that's a fun and affectionate look at the immigrants of America using New York City as sort of like, at this time they always talked about the melting pot, but paying tribute to all the people who make up New York City. Baghdad on the subway. That's what O. Henry called New York, the town where East meets West amidst the babble of a hundred tongues. New York is where the Latin rumba shares a jukebox with a beer barrel polka. Manhattan's Lower East Side is a living example of America's melting pot in action and has become a New World version of the Old World Bazaar. Bargaining between merchant and customer still remains an art. Here, individuals appraise the quality of the goods and test each other's wit and willpower. Even the young learn quickly that it's each man for himself. In a world where panties and pickles live side by side. But even this old world marketplace of all nations has bowed to Yankee flavor and rhythm. Hurry, 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 hurry. The world is so full of a number of things, and we don't want to miss any. The 
Spanish equivalent for an ice cream cone is Bidiagua. For a few pennies, the street corner vendor shaves the ice, and from a rainbow of flavors, your own choice colors the frosty cone. Here's a cooling treat that satisfies the sweet tooth, common to youngsters the world over. The smile foreshadows delights to come. Yet sugar and spice and everything nice is just a small part of New York life for young Puerto Ricanos. Some earn extra money selling shopping bags or with a shoe shine box on a busy corner. When life becomes hard and problems are puzzling, one is willing to accept some outside guidance to success and happiness. Polly, the fortune teller, relies on chance rather than reason. Song and music, too, help to carry the burden of the day, and musicians performing in the public square have delighted people for thousands of years. Man cannot live by bread alone, and the soul is nourished by art as well as spiritual inspiration. England raises her heroes on the playing fields of Eton, but the Sandlot, or New York Central Park, does nicely for Americans of all races. Even the World Series cannot excel the spirit of this game between two Puerto Rican neighborhood teams. It won't be long before this youngster will be right in there batting him out. And who knows, the greats, the DiMaggio's, Robinson's, Campanella's, and Williams got their start just like this. From bullfights to sandlot baseball, exciting sports are favored around the world by people of Spanish descent. Chinatown calls up memories of subtle foods, Aromas of oriental delicacies linger in the streets. Newsstands, which carry the community's five Chinese language dailies, help to give these streets a foreign appearance. But Johnny Lum, like any other American kid, has his own reading habits. And this could be any street in New York. Beautiful oriental handicrafts attract thousands of travelers who in many ways are the most amusing sights in Chinatown. The really big event in this community's life comes with the celebration of the Chinese New Year when Eastern customs and Eastern symbols turn this section of New York into a corner of the Far East. This is New York City, where you can make a trip around the world in the shadows of the skyscrapers. Again, if you want to watch that entire film, uh, it's 20 minutes long and it's got parades and it has a section about Italians and Germans in there. Uh, the link is down below or you can just search around the world in New York in the Internet Archive. And so next I'd like to turn our attention to four films that are basically about the U.S.-Mexico border or um, Mexican immigrants and Mexican immigration. So this film you're looking at here from 1916 was made by the U.S. Army and its refugees at the U.S.-Mexico border um, at the time when we sent an expedition down there to um, capture and kill Pancho Villa because uh, 
they were having a civil war and there were incursions into Texas and the U.S. territory and some Americans were killed. So General Pershing le led a, um, a force and they did a lot of filming and I find this film to be just amazing. So this one from 1922 is from the National Archives. Mexicans and Japanese pickers harvest California orange crop. So this is, this is a Ford educational film. Uh, the Ford Motor Company made hundreds and hundreds of films and they had weekly newsreels and this was one of them. They're showing um, something that um, was very important to agriculture at the time. The this, this Saimar Grove in Southern California is the largest olive orchard in the world. There's the largest olive orchard in the world, according to Ford. But they're showing how uh, this agriculture depended greatly on Mexican immigrants, Japanese as well. Mexican olive pickers camp in the orchards during the harvesting season. This was made in 1922. There's a family. And at that time, the border was fairly open for these workers. What would happen later is that during the Depression, the olives are beaten off the tree and gathered by children. During the Depression, um, things changed and people started claiming that these workers were taking jobs away from Americans. Ripe olives are very bitter and are never eaten as they come from the trees. Um, and there's an olive picker right there. So many thousands of Mexican Americans were deported. You can read all about it in America for the Americans, A History of Xenophobia in the United States by Erica Lee. So now we're going to jump forward to 1962. Farming is America's biggest industry. While most major American industries have made great advances in productivity, agriculture has outpaced them all. One of the reasons has been intense mechanization. Progress in mechanization has been impressive. However, some crops must still be harvested by hand, where such things as inspection, selection, cutting, or gentle handling are basic to quality. Yet even now, practically every hand-picked crop is under intensive study. And a constant flow of new and remarkable experimental equipment is on trial, all designed to relieve man's age-old burden of manual labor. But until each piece of equipment can be shown to eliminate hand labor, and reduce cost with no sacrifice in quality. Until then, much of the work must still be manual. And the placement of thousands of workers at the right place, at the right time, is an immense job, especially at harvest time. Overall, the job has been successfully carried through, even in the many crops calling for stoop labor. Here is stoop labor in the literal meaning of the term but the term is also applied to many of the toughest and least desirable farm jobs. For example, no stooping here, yet because citrus trees are thorny, more difficult to pick than other fruits, most farm workers avoid this kind of job. All such farm jobs which are tough, dirty, or unpleasant are generally referred to as stoop labor. Understandably then, this is the only area in which the American farm labor supply falls short and is supplemented by Mexican citizens, sometimes called nationals or Mexican nationals. But the term most commonly used is braceros. In Spanish, this means a man who works with his arms and hands. It so happens that the braceros form a tiny fraction of the total labor force used on our farms. Yet some Americans feel even this tiny fraction should not be used. A typical dialogue pinpoints the major issues. Well, with Americans on relief rolls, why bring in foreigners to work on our farms? Makes no sense. Makes sense to the farmer, though. These braceros work for lower pay than Americans would. 
But doesn't the farmer realize he's cutting down American labor, cutting down our living standards? Why doesn't somebody do something about it? In short, the big question in many minds is why Braceros? The question is so widespread that we consider it a public service to tell the why and how of Braceros on American farms. So if you want to see what the California growers, the Council of California Growers, um, what their opinion is of the Braceros program and how it worked, uh, you can watch this 1962 film. Um, I just showed three minutes of 20, and it's available online at cspan.org. Uh, it was part of the Real America series that I produced before I retired recently. And if you just go to cspan.org and search Why Braceros, you'll, you can watch the entire film there. Now, for a counterpoint to what you just saw, uh, from 1966, a pro-labor film called The Land is Rich. It's five minutes of a 26-minute film. Small-scale organizing drives have done little more than create the illusion of helping farm workers. The well-padded officialdom has, for the most part, kept its back turned on the most poverty-stricken group of workers in the nation. For half a century, the agribusiness lobby has been a constant roadblock in the path of social legislation for farm workers. They have denied unemployment insurance to farm workers. They denied farm workers the benefits of minimum wage legislation until the summer of 1966, when the first small breakthrough was made in the Federal Congress. They even blocked legislation to provide sanitation facilities for field workers. It was only in the 1960s that a law was passed finally in California requiring field toilets for women. In 1962, in Fresno, California, the National Farm Workers Association was formed. The association recognized some essential common denominators. A substantial segment California's farm workers are of Mexican ancestry, tied together by a proud culture, a common religion, and the bond of a great and lyrical language. A new demand was made for an end to ancient injustices. A contagion was in the air. Slowly, farm wage rates began to reflect the pressures. They started to creep upward. People were on the march. Two organizations, the National Farm Workers Association Independent and the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee, an entity of the AFL-CIO, were in the field. In December of 1964, Bracero program, the treaty importation of Mexican field workers, came to an end. The closing of this traffic removed a major weapon from the hands of agribusiness and equalized somewhat the odds facing those endeavoring to organize farm workers. Some braceros returned almost immediately as legal immigrants, green card workers, permit workers. But the relative position of the domestic workforce had beyond question been strengthened. And a substantial segment of that workforce was of Mexican ancestry. From this base came the National Farm Workers Association under Cesar Chavez. In alliance with the Agriculture Workers Organizing Committee, it began a new chapter in the long farm worker history at the little San Joaquin Valley town of Delano in September of 1965. The Delano grape strike, begun for union recognition and a pay scale of 140 an hour, became much more than that, as the strikers themselves were to declare in their own manifesto, the plan of Delano. We are conscious of the historical significance of our pilgrimage. It is clearly evident that our path travels through a valley well known to all Mexican farm workers. We know all of these towns of Delano, Madera, Fresno, Modesto, Stockton, and Sacramento because along this very same road, in this very same valley, the Mexican race has sacrificed itself for the last hundred years. Our sweat and our blood have fallen on this land to make other men rich. This pilgrimage is a witness to the suffering we have seen for generations. The penance we accept symbolizes the suffering we shall have in order to bring justice to these same towns, to this same valley. The pilgrimage we make 
symbolizes the long historical road we have traveled in this valley alone, and the long road we have yet to travel with much penance in order to bring about the revolution we need. The Delano strike again projected the plight of farm workers into the consciousness of the nation. The Delano strike brought the two unions into direct confrontation with one of the giants of agribusiness, D. Giorgio. D. Giorgio, the far-flung corporation that made more than $2 million in profits in 1963, became the focal point of a bitter struggle. Congressional investigators came to Delano. Such investigations are not new. The plight of farm labor in California is probably one of the most studied and investigated subjects in the annals of human suffering. Report has been piled upon report, but proposed remedies have been frustrated or ignored. This was true in the 30s. It's just as true today. So now let's go back to 1966 again. And this film was made by the U.S. Information Agency. It's part of the National Archives collections. It's called Have a Coke. I just chose a kind of condensed three-minute section of it. Um, the description from the National Archives says, it depicts in a humorous vein the impressions of three Ethiopian students upon entering a strange country and the perplexing world of university life at UCLA. Breakfast is served early and is very unusual. My roommate is an American from Arizona studying civil engineering. He is failing calculus and is very uncommunicative. And he probably finds me the same way. For five months now, I have had time for little besides study, worry about money, and wonder why I ever came here. The English examination I passed in Addis Ababa with such fluency is simply not the same language spoken here. The constant series of quizzes I find irritating. Most are transparently designed to inform the professor whether you've read his assignment. Of course I haven't read his assignment. There is no time to read assignments. Aside from the library, my class buildings and the dormitory, I know little of the campus and less of the city. I feel like the village idiot treated with polite deference by my colleagues. It is maddening. Occasional walks in the evening with advice and friendship from my own people were genuinely pleasurable moments. But when the year's examinations were finished, I felt it pointless to continue here in frustration, loneliness and poverty. I was about to wire for passage home when I received notification that my grades were very high and I had been accepted by my department as teaching assistant. Fantastic. I shall stay another year. But uh, if it is anything like the last one, I am leaving. But it's taken you five years, Tamru, and you have not finished yet. As a matter of fact, my dear Heidi, my government has just inquired, Tamru, are you still a student or a refugee? What takes so long? Have some coffee. Oh, thank you. Thank you. What country are you all from? Ethiopia. 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 Oh, how wonderful. So glad you could come. Thank you. Thank you. As I was saying, why does it take five years to finish? This sort of thing for one. And then I have to spend a lot of time giving you all advice. 
However, I'm beginning to feel more pressing obligations along that line. So, there is less time than ever, not counting my two jobs. But, with all the demands, I'm still satisfied. In no other system could I enroll first for a limited study, continue on becoming a member of the staff, complete a program for a doctorate, and still support a family. Again, you can watch that entire film online. Just search for Have a Coke, 1966, in quotes, or look, at, look for the link in the body of our um, YouTube video here. Uh, let's go forward now to 1980 and a film about refugees. This was made by the U.S. Information Agency. Uh, this is just a... a three to four minute clip from a half hour film and it's called In Their Own Words and it's all about the merry old boat lift of 1980. In less than 90 days, between April and June of 1980, more than 110,000 Cubans flee Cuba. They come the 140 kilometers from the Port of Mariel to Key West, Florida in nearly 2,000 boats. Twenty-five die in the attempt. Why do they come? Why are there so many? How do they feel? que ha aprovechado más o menos esta, esta oportunidad o este desastre para llegar aquí. Y en realidad lo que, la sensación que yo siento en ningún momento es de triunfo, ni digamos de una gran alegría, sino es una sensación hasta cierto punto de paz por, por estar vivo y por haber salido de allí. Pero es la misma sensación que puede sentir una persona que sale de la casa cuando se está quemando, o sea, la casa se quemó de todos modos y yo me salvé la vida, pero la casa se quemó. Sobeida Castellanos, actriz. Eh, yo, la experiencia que tengo es que yo decidí venir, eh, salir de Cuba porque recibí la visita de familiares míos que viven aquí hace muchos años. Y realmente la represión es tan grande que uno mismo llega a reprimirse y yo ni siquiera había pensado en salir, porque yo misma me lo bloqueaba. Entonces, 
desperté cuando tuve el choque con mi familia y me di cuenta que, que yo tenía algo muerto. Entonces me di cuenta que, que ellos estaban vivos, estaban llenos de ilusiones y de ideas y que yo estaba muerta. So next we go to 1981. I thought because we are pulling out of Afghanistan after so many years that I would take us back to 1981 uh, when we first started getting really interested in Afghanistan. This is called Afghanistan, the Gallant Struggle. It comes from the National Archives, but it was a video report put together by the CIA for President Reagan uh, showing two minutes of 20. Um, apparently, Ronald Reagan liked video reports like this to give him an idea of what was going on in the world. And so, in 1979, the Soviet Union invaded, and I pulled out a section of this longer film just that deals with the, uh, mostly with the refugee problem that they were having at the time. Almost two million Afghans have turned their backs on communism and climbed through the narrow mountain passes into neighboring Pakistan. A third to a half are children. The need for food, shelter, and medical aid is great in the crowded refugee centers that dot the border of Pakistan's northwest frontier and Baluchistan provinces. Another several hundred thousand refugees have crossed into Iran. The Babrak government probably at the urging of Soviet advisors, set a grace period for refugees to return without reprisal. There were few takers. The government now has indicated it will confiscate the property of refugees who do not return. For many, there would be little to reclaim. Soviet gunships, MiG fighters, and artillery have pulverized homes and entire villages. In just a two-week period in June 1980, 50 to 60 Afghan villages were leveled. There have been reports of large-scale killings of civilians, including a massacre in the Konar province town of Kerala. Survivors told of over 1,000 men and boys being killed. Despite the war's devastation, the tribes of the Afghan mountains do not appear in awe of Soviet military power. Their chief need, they say, is weapons. Give us rockets to deal with the helicopters, says a rebel leader, and we will drive the Russians out. The fact that the original communist coup and subsequent Soviet invasion occurred in this staunchly Muslim country has solidified religious support for the Afghan insurgents, both from within and outside the country. At services commemorating the Prophet Muhammad's birthday, mullahs have exhorted their congregations to slay the Soviet infidels and their supporters in the Babrak regime. The Afghan insurgents have successfully used religious unity in their recruiting drives. So now we close how we started with Island of Hope, Island of Tears from 1989. This Charles Guggenheim film about Ellis Island is 29 minutes. This final piece of film I'm showing is six minutes. It's a National Park Service film, so that means it's in the public domain. Thanks once again to Tacoma Park for hosting these, and thank you for watching if you stayed all the way to the end. Tens of millions of us have relatives who came this way. sat in this room, part of the largest human migration in history. Of the many who came, some were turned away. But even they would leave part of themselves in America to remind us why they had come so far, why they had made the journey.
still separated from the first class and cabin passengers who were processed by immigration officials on board. The immigrant from steerage waited yet another boat ride. This one from the Hudson River Pier to an island in the upper bay. Crowded into barges and ferries, they approached the place that had become a legend in their mind. get my eyes on that. It's great. I was kind of glad to see Alice Island as bad as it was. <laughs> it was good to see any kind of land. It was. According to the houses I left in my town, this was like, <laughs> like a whole city. And I almost felt smaller than I am. When I came through these doors, I saw all these people there. I figured, well, I guess I, I'll have to stay here for good, probably, because it, all, all these people, what are, they, what are they doing here? And nobody was happy. You don't know what's going to happen. Clinging to their possessions, they entered the great building and climbed the stairs. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, I says, where am I? They would come right into the big hall, and there they were told to sit and stay there. And they didn't know where they were. It was a new land, but they hadn't been in land. It was just a big hall. And all you could get was tears and crying of the children. For the vast majority, the process would last less than a day. But now they waited. Those from Europe and the Near East, with those who had arrived from the Caribbean. Those who were the first in their family to come to America, with those who would be met. Those who came to make money in return, with those who were determined never to return. So they all had this fear, this worry. They were worried about police, because they were always checked in the other countries. The word government frightened. Government was tyranny. Government was officers who, who looked at you with a sense that they wanted to hate you or eliminate you. And the idea that there is democracy or that the policeman will help you was very new to me. The policeman, uh, to me, was uh, someone who could cut my head off. It's not my native land, but it, it means more to me than, than my native land. It means more to me than my native land. Any country on earth, you can, you, this never happened. And become a human being again. It's a miracle. I'm glad I'm here. Couldn't be any better, could it? And everybody had hopes. And one thing I was sure, and thousands like me, that the degradation, the abuse, and the privation that we had in Europe, we wouldn't have here. Oh, God, yes. Hoping for centuries.
Yeah. 